Editing was a very important thing, of course. In the early days, television was done uh, 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 magnetically. In other words, it, uh, 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 like film, television has got frames built into it. Uh, television is it's basically 30 frames per second. It's a little bit different in color. It's 59.94, but let's call it 60 to keep it simple, uh, or 30 to keep it simple. 60 fields, 30 frames. Uh, and, uh, and when you edit film, people look at the film and they, they edit right on the frames, one frame to another. In television, you have two fields to make up a frame, and you, when you edit, you need to edit right exactly on the frame. Otherwise, you'll have a glitch and the picture will jiggle, and you don't want that when you're doing that. So the way we did it at, in the beginning was to uh, lay down the pulse which is a frame pulse, and then when he selected the spot where, the, where it was to be uh, clipped, then we would put a, a thing called Ediview, which was a, uh, a mag a, an oxide, magnetic oxide. And that would, uh, when we put that on with a thin film with a brush, it would then show up the edit points right through it. And then we would take a uh, 40 power microscope on a cutter and we would cut right on that frame, and that's the way it was spliced in those early days. Well, that was a cumbersome thing, and it turns out that in 1961 and going into 62, uh, Jim Shokey came to me and he said, you know, we, uh, we sure need to be able to edit to the frame. Right now, it's, it's cumbersome, it's taking a lot of time. Could you build something like that? And I thought, and I said, well, Probably, but I didn't know if I could, really. But I, I, I said, I'll give it a try. Give me, give me a week to think about it, and I'll get back to you. So I did. And I finally came up with a device, and, uh, uh, and it was uh, called, actually, you named it, uh, I named it uh, TVOLA, TV hyphen OLA, TVOLA. And uh, it was a uh, device that had four monitors on it, and they were storage monitors. You could store them, and they would they would freeze in each one. So I made that that thing so that you would capture first zero frame. I mean zero seconds, one second, two seconds, and three seconds. And you, you'd have then four pictures you could look at. Now you decide between which frames, what two frames would you do want to look closer. So if you chose between the second frame and the third frame, then you would put the thing through the machine again and you set it so that it would go to a quarter of a second. Then you'd run it through because it laid down a marker. You had played it through, it would then spew out uh, four frames, but they were a quarter of a second apart. Now I could look at there and see between what two frames on those monitors would you want to select the picture. So you'd select, say, between the third and the fourth picture, and you'd go back, you'd lay a marker down, and it would go back, and you'd play it again, and then it would lay down a tenth of uh, a four, one, two, three, four, a tenth of a second apart, and then, and then you would select between which two tenths of a second. So if you chose between the second monitor and the third monitor, then you'd put a marker down. It would automatically. You'd go back, play it again. This time it would lay down four consecutive frames. Now you could look at that frame. You say, "I want to do it there." So you'd, then you'd, it would then go back and put a marker down where you wanted to do it, and then it would develop that, uh, it would lay that down, and then when you put the edit view over it, you would see your marker, and you would slice it there. And uh, that we used that particular thing, we got patents on it, and used it with our productions for the Bolshev Ballet, where we did uh, a lot of productions there on stage six, uh, using uh, Marconi's four and a half inch image orthicons, and so on. And uh, we used that to our advantage, and it was kind of kept a secret. Uh, Paramount wanted to, it was a trade secret, so we didn't make a great deal on that. However, we did have a fellow that uh, did a write-up on it. Uh, we were able to get permission to do that, and we have documentation on that, and you, have, you can have access to that anytime you want. Uh, and then, but, and we, uh, 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 it was determined by Ampex, who's the leading, of course, tape manufacturer, and had long been into color and so on, that uh, they 
actually they were just getting into color. They were, a lot of things were still being done in black and white. And the Bolshevik Ballet was done in black and white, but being four and a half inch in the Jothicons, the quality was just outstanding. Contrast ratios were, were super, and it just was uh, extra quality that we made a lot of money off of. Ampex then got the word that, uh, that we had this device, and so we, uh, they came over and we agreed to demonstrate it to them. And they were very interested in buying it at that time. Well, so they went back to think about it. We gave them a price and all that. And during that time, lo and behold, one of their engineers came up with the idea of flying a race head. Well, that was a discovery that, to end all discoveries as far as videotape is concerned, and that's where the, uh, the head, there's a special head on there, and that actually allows you to identify frames and uh, make edits electronically uh, through the use of this, uh, this edit head. And it's been used in, in, uh, in videotape uh, editing ever since. And of course that killed the idea of them wanting to buy it. We still continued to use our device because nothing was built at that point. And then finally when it reached the market, I'm talking about the, the edit head uh, uh, type of device, then of course we switched over to that because that was proved to be the superior way to do it.